What a joy to be here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, <laughs> ah, I knew I'd get a laugh with that. <laughs> Frankly, my dear, I'd rather be diving. <laughs> I'd even rather be diving in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Actually, it's where I started diving many years ago. So it's with particular personal sadness that I view what's happening now. What you're seeing on the screen, actually, is an event that takes place every summer in the Gulf of Mexico in August. When this spill first began, people weren't so concerned about the fact that, well, there's a usual coral spawn in the end of summer, but the spill is way back here in, in April, and they're going to get it under control, right? Huh. That's what we all thought was going to happen. But here it is, many days, weeks, and now even a couple of months later. And the prospects do not look so good for the corals and for a lot of the rest of life in this ninth largest body of water on Earth, the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm really going to not show you oily pelicans or the sad scenes of whales slathered with oil. I'm rather going to show you causes for hope and also the dream that we should aspire to, a healthy Gulf of Mexico, a healthy ocean, not just for creatures such as these, these snappers that gather off Belize. They gather in many places, or at least they used to, but because you see so many fish all together, it's such a great place to go catch fish, if that's your business, to catch fish. It's hard to resist getting so many all at once in today's world where there's a global market and means to catch and send your caught fish to places all over the world. And look what happens when fish spawn in abundance, or at least what has been happening in times past, whale sharks, these plankton-feeding creatures. There's a lot, lot of attention has been focused, and rightly so, on the people around the rim of the Gulf of Mexico and the, the creatures who occupy the marshes and the, the beaches, the coastal rim of the Gulf. But I really want to emphasize during the few minutes that I have with you to be a voice for the Gulf of Mexico, you know, for the water, that juicy part from the surface down to the bottom. You heard earlier from Dave Gallo talking about the bottom of the ocean that's really important. Creatures such as this little jawfish live there. The bottom of the ocean is not just rocks or rocks and mud or mud and sand, although that's the image that a lot of people have for the Gulf of Mexico, perhaps, and for the world's oceans, just not realizing that we're talking about the most ab abundantly populated parts of the planet, the ocean. That is, after all, more than 95% of the biosphere it's where 97% of Earth's water is, and where there's water, there's life. The cross-section of life on Earth. And now this particular chunk of ocean, this particular chunk of cross-section of life on Earth is at risk. It's already been degraded over the last, well, several centuries, but especially the last half century with technologies developed during wartime use for looking at ways and means of, of combating enemies that we perceive. Now we're taking the, that same kind of technology and apply it to taking things from the ocean, exploring the ocean. Not all of this is bad news, but the fact that we now have the capacity to find and extract and ship all over the world, not just oil and gas, but living creatures taken from the ocean that until just about this point in time have been, have been safe from human, humans as predators. But when you think about the impacts that we have had on the Gulf of Mexico, apart from the petrochemical impacts that have taken place over the last several decades, our ability to bring down the numbers of groupers, of snappers, of sharks, of swordfish, of tunas, you perhaps have already heard that 
one of the two areas in the Atlantic known for spawning tunas, bluefins, is in the Gulf of Mexico. And for whatever reasons, their primary area for spawning is right about where the ground central, wherever it is, the, you know, the place ground zero, where the spill is now taking place. We don't know what the effects will be, but we know that if you were to write a recipe for good health for the Gulf of Mexico, for the lives of the creatures who live there, it would not include use of dispersants to combat this mega spill. It would not include the spills at all. I think I'm among those who have slipped into a kind of complacency about the drilling, finding drilling, and extraction of oil and shipping around the world, believing that the big problems were primarily with the shipping, because in recent times, that's where the big problems have come from. But now we know <laughs> that the risk, however small, is not worth the trade-off, and that we really have to rethink not just how do you find the fossil fuels deep within the earth, whether it's on the land or in the sea, how, not just how do you extract them and ship them, but how do you do it safely if something goes wrong and something has gone terribly wrong? But I want to shine the light on something that, for me at least, is a sign of hope in what is otherwise increasingly a sea of despair. Just a week ago, less than a week ago, I was in the Gulf of Mexico, actually this time last Monday, I was splashing around looking at sargassum mats in the Gulf of Mexico, actually looking with Eric Hoffmeyer, a scientist who is studying whale sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. Who knew there were whale sharks in the Gulf of Mexico? But they are there. He has for several years now been finding and beginning to tag some so that he can track their mo movements. Like Barbara Block has been finding and tacking bluefin tuna and turtles and other large animals to follow their tracks. Well, Eric knew that in the topographic highs, these little miniature mountains in the northern Gulf of Mexico, about 70 to 80 miles offshore, places like the Flower Garden Banks, one of the national marine sanctuaries, salt domes that rise up off the seafloor, sometimes just a few hundred feet, but enough of a configuration to be a place where creatures such as corals, if they come close enough to the surface, or deep corals if they're down in the deeper water, just a great habitat for all kinds of creatures. And as it turns out, one of them, called Ewing Bank, E-W-I-N-G, is a place that somehow is a siren song for whale sharks. Let me just show you with a little clip that was made this time last week, only one day later, Tuesday. We spent all day in the water with these magnificent speckled beauties. We had looked all day one day, saw nothing. The next morning, about 5.30, we were awakened by the sound of somebody saying, whale sharks, whale sharks. We almost had them bumping up against the boat. Let's roll this next little video clip, please. Coming up. <laughs> My partners in this, of course, Eric Hoffmeyer, the whale scientist, with him, with Bob Nixon of The Cove fame. The reason we're here for this glimpse of what's happening in the Gulf is to try to find and tag some of the really big guys, the whale sharks. These animals are sharks. in this region to feed. And in the area the oil spill is, is an important feeding area for them. It's essential habitat. And right now, we don't know how they're responding to this oil. It's an ocean full of whale sharks. I can't even count the number of fins. As soon as I think I have a number, <laughs> six more pop up. We need to start tagging these guys and looking at their movements in relation to the oil to determine if indeed they are avoiding it and staying away, or if they are actually going into it and, and succumbing to the oil. Is Eric applying a tag? Man. How does that work? The Louisiana punch? I called him Samson because he was the biggest one. He was the Mac Daddy. He was the big boy of the bunch. 
two of those tags are spot tags. So they're, they're surface satellite tags. So the first thing we want to do is get online, let's see how they're reporting, how often they're reporting, all that. So hopefully we'll have hits from the day. As long as the, the satellite has to be overheaded, it comes overhead you know, three to six times a day. As long as those two things line up, it will send a signal. Ding, ding. And it'll say, here I am. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they, what happens if they encounter the oil, where they go with it, you know? Yeah. The comment that some have said about the whale sharks in the Gulf of Mexico, that they're on death row, could be true. It could be that because of their feeding habits, they skim right at the surface where the oil accumulates. They're in harm's way. So indeed, they are in harm's way. We were 70 miles south of Fushan, the closest big place to where we were. It was New Orleans. The shoreline there is, is you know, a disaster zone. But offshore, it was amazing. I was pleased that there were signs of hope. It's very much in keeping with something that Ted provided for me a little more than a year ago, in February of 2009, some of you know, I was granted a wish. I got the TED Prize, 2009, which really is a, a fantastic experience to have the TED community get behind something that you think is important, important enough, a wish that can change the world. My wish was that we could mobilize, you know, all of us, a, a campaign to really support an understanding of the ocean to pull out all stops, new technologies, whatever it takes, and to embrace hope spots, places in the ocean large enough to protect the blue heart of the planet, the ocean. Hope spots included, have included for me since I was a little kid growing up on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, include the Gulf of Mexico even before this terrible spill. Now, even more so, we need to embrace those places that remain within the Gulf system so that there is hope for restoration once, I hope, in due course, this, this avalanche of oil is turned off <coughs> and recovery can begin. <coughs> we think about restitution for the fishermen. <laughs> we think about the hotel owners, the people around the Gulf who, who need help to get their lives back together again. But we need to think about giving back to the Gulf of Mexico itself the life that is there, that supports all these livelihoods, oh, by the way, of the people. We are tied to the ocean, not just those who live along the edge. There's one more little film clip I want to share with you. This one is a downstream view. You know, this oil keeps gushing, keeps flowing, keeps moving. The projections are that it won't be long before not just the loop current, but ultimately the Gulf Stream will pick up this load of toxic material the, the dispersants that have been added, millions of gallons of dispersants, along with the oil itself, and be swept around the tip of Florida between Cuba and the tip of Florida, up along the east coast of the United States, and engulfing the Gulf Stream. <laughs> That's the expressway. It moves very fast and could quickly take whatever there is northward and touch on a place that is another hope spot, the Sargasso Sea, this floating golden forest of marine plants that also has a counterpart in the Gulf of Mexico, now also much at risk. Could we have that next video? This will be narrated, and I'll make some comments at the end of it. If we could, off to the Sargasso Sea with some old technology that launched us into the deep sea where William Beebe, back in the 1930s, explored Humpback the whales pass through these waters each year, migrating from polar feeding grounds. These waters are also known to legions of luminous deep sea creatures and intrepid undersea explorers. In the 1930s, zoologist William Beebe and engineer Otis Barton descended a thousand meters into the depths around Bermuda for a first view of life in a place the sunlight never reaches. Bibi compared what he saw to naked space itself, out far beyond atmosphere, between the stars, 
where the blackness of space, the shining planets, comets, suns, and stars must really be closely akin to the world of life as it appears to the eyes of an old human being in the open ocean, one half mile down. For Bibi and Barton, the comets, suns, and stars were living creatures reflecting rainbows of iridescence, were flashing, sparkling, and glowing with their own living light. Fireflies and glowworms are famous light makers on the land, but in the deep sea, about 90% of the creatures, jellies, fish, bacteria, shrimp, squids, and many others, have some form of bioluminescence to signal one another. Scientists say these bursts of starry light may be the most common form of communication on the planet. In the open sea, jellies are also among the most abundant forms of life. The Gulf Stream current can carry these oddly beautiful drifters along at about 160 kilometers a day. Buffered by the Gulf Stream is a magically quiet, gently rotating mass of sargassum weed that expands over more than five million square kilometers of open waters. Isolated by walls of fast-moving currents between Bermuda and Puerto Rico, the Sargasso Sea holds a liquid jungle of creatures which have evolved over the ages to exist in floating forests of golden brown sargassum. Within its leafy, sunlit masses are camouflaged such creatures as loggerhead turtles, filefish, sea hares, and the speckled brown sargasso crab. For scientists, it's a living laboratory, strategically located in the open sea. For creatures that live in the undersea caves, among the reefs, and in the great depths below, Bermuda is simply home. Here's the thing, we are all sea creatures. The ocean is home, in a sense, for all of us. There isn't a lot of water on Earth, in a sense, when you think of the amount of space there is, this thin little layer. David Gallo explained that in great graphic detail, and yet in all of the solar system, in all of the universe, there is no place like this blue home of ours. Everything that we can do to take care of the Gulf of Mexico, to restore health, to take care of the ocean that in a larger sense is suffering from many of the same things we're seeing in the Gulf. We've taken too much out. We've put too many negative things into the, our life support system. The good news is that for the first time in history, we have the capacity through tools such as Google Earth and the ocean in Google Earth through the ability to be high in the sky in, with satellites, with human observers up in the space shuttle, with people on the moon looking back, to give us the insight that would not have been possible, get this, but for the use of fossil fuels. We have burned through the assets over the ages, the last few decades. The age, it has taken millions of years to get us enough of this energy to give us a jump start on understanding. But I think sometimes of, of the words of T.S. Eliot about exploration, that we will not cease our ex exploring in the end of all our exploring, we will not cease our exploration in the end of all our exploring, will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The key now is to know ourselves for the first time, to hold up the mirror, see what we're doing to the planet, understand that while fossil fuels may have driven us to this magical crossroads of understanding, now is the time. We have a little window before it's too late to take actions that will secure for not just the creatures of the sea, but for all of us who are connected to the sea. We are sea creatures. Thank you. <laughs>